Thank you all for coming out. Um, Sal, so before I like it. Um, so ultimately, kind of gave a little bit of the spiel before, but ultimately what I want you guys to get out of this is just have more confidence, more clarity on some of the big rocks when it comes to something like nutrition. If you do some research on your own, WebMD, Google, whatever other sources you might find, it might lead you with a lot of information that you don't know how to navigate. So I hope more than anything, even if things are stuff you know before, provide you with another perspective, it can help direct you a little bit more. So kind of take what you do know, what you will learn today, and move that into not just stuff in your head, but just actionable steps that you can take to improve your nutrition and then everything that comes with that, more energy throughout the day, more focus, more effort. Sorry, I'm no, no worries at all. We're just getting started. Um, and what's your name? Jennifer. Jennifer, cool. Um, and just give you that sense of, I know a little bit more now than I did before. Um, so I've kind of talked a little bit about this, uh, just in conversation. Um, like I said, some education stuff here. Um, been doing this for about five years now, um, bouncing around from different, different gyms, and now doing this as my own business, my own career at this point. So. One of my favorite things that I've learned as being a teacher is presenting and sharing the information to people who could use it. So I do ask if you have questions, feel free to ask on the spot, don't have to wait till the end. Um, and it kind of helps everybody to make it feel more like a discussion, more, or less, more than just me telling you stuff. So I'm definitely on board with having some good dialogue and some good back and forth. So some of the more finer points that we will cover, um, can everybody see that okay? Is it too small, too big? Cool. Um, what is that definition of a healthy diet for you? There's a lot of different things out there. Debbie, you mentioned it a little bit when it was just a lot of different trends and things like that, but what could mean healthy to you might be different for somebody else. So there is those preferences and there's those personal things, whether it's related to medical conditions, whether it's related to how well you want to perform at the gym and life or whatever it may be. There are some things that um, can help steer you in a direction based on what you want out of health and what you want out of your healthy routine. What are the most important factors and what are those principles that all these success stories that you see about online, on the magazines, on ShopRite, I know I see it all the time, my eyes always go to it, drop 30 pounds in four days, not four days, in like four weeks by following this newest diet craze. So there's, whether or not that's the right or the wrong way to do it, there have been success stories on things that are more sustainable, like a keto, like a plant-based, like a Mediterranean style diet, and there's some commonalities that we'll go through that kind of answer the question of why do these work for such a broad scope of different people. And then how can you actually plan, prepare, and create options for yourself so you can stay on track. Uh, one of the biggest things I've noticed working with different people is things start to fall off when they don't have a way to reel themselves back in. When they don't have a way to kind of get off the negative track that they're on and turn it back into a positive, and those three things right there, I've been realizing is something that's not talked about as much, but it's probably one of the most crucial pieces of it to make sure that you can actually create the routine, change your pattern, and change the behaviors that lead to an overall healthy kind of uh, relationship with nutrition. So, first thing is, what do you really define as healthy? There's a lot of different things you can define. There could be a physical appearance, it could be a weight on the scale, it could be foods that you work out and foods in, that you eat, workouts you do. This could be definitely something that you might agree with, might not agree with, but ultimately what we want to make sure is that whatever that reason is, it's not limiting time with the family, it's not limiting your ability to have the enjoyment of food, right? Food brings people together, food tastes good. Food is something that can be shared among different groups of people, so it has that more in social, social aspect of it as well. And it shouldn't leave you feeling like you're feeling bad about not wanting to do certain things. So I don't want you to feel like you have to be hyper-focused on how many calories, how many carbs, how many proteins, fats. That stuff kind of comes secondary and making sure that it's not something that is going to actually impact your ability from a mental health standpoint. Because there is a term um, where people get so hyper-focused that they end up having a worse kind of outcome because everything details measured doesn't have that flexibility and it doesn't give you the options to actually do things and change things as life comes up and changes the uh, routine for you. 
So when I think of health, things I want to make sure that people are aware of is there should be the, the right markers of health. There are some things that can be associated with longer longevity, better qualities of life, but it's also more to the story than that. It should give you the confidence and the comfort that what you're doing is going to be helping move you in that right direction of whatever it is you want to go to. It's going to allow that flexibility and then it's going to allow you to perform those activities that you do enjoy doing. And a lot of the emphasis on physical activity is going to grow as the weather gets nicer, more walks, might be playing more outdoor sports, things like pickleball are going to be out, back outside again, which is going to be fun. Um, so being able to feel good, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, but also in those activities is a definitely an impact, can be impacted by what you define as healthy. <clears throat> so these are some of the factors that we kind of talked about already. Um, overall, it gives you that complete kind of deep health, if you will, where it's a combination of performance, how ability to have enough energy throughout the day, being able to set a good example for your family, for your loved ones, for your kids, so that they can learn those helpful patterns to have a good relationship with food, with the nutrition side of it. Staying active as you get older. And then, like I said, performance in the gym that you are passionate about, performance in the activities or sports, um, or just being able to do more and feel confident that you are doing things that are going to set you up for success for your health. So when we're defining healthy diet, this is where, kind of Debbie, this is where I was thinking when I, you asked that question in the beginning, um, there's a lot of different things that might look familiar here. Atkins, keto, carnivore, plant-based, vegan, Mediterranean, keto, keto's on the twice, see? It's on my mind that much. <laughs> um, then there's South Beach, right? So there's a lot, of, there's more to this list. If you were to write every single, the list would probably go all the way down to the floor. Um, but there's something about these that I always like to bring up and why these might work for different people and different um, walks of life. If we think back to when humans were kind of coming up in the ancestral times, right? There's a different regions, different locations, have different resources available to them. A good example is the, um, a lot, the Alaskan region, Arctic Circle region, the um, Inuits had a lot of fatty sources of food, so blubber, um, a lot of fish, not as much like wild game or fruits and vegetables, so their diet relied heavily on that. Versus uh, cultures like maybe the Native Americans who might have had more access to grains and agriculture kind of stuff. So just right there, there's a massive difference in those types of diets, but both have been kind of proven to be healthy and work for certain people and their individual preferences and needs. So rather than thinking of all this stuff as you know, is there really a diet that's better or worse than the other? I would argue that there's really no one diet that's going to be better. But there's something that I want us to think about is the similarities is probably the better question. So what are the similarities? What are the things that all these things share that make them workable for different people, different goals, different walks of life? Am I talking too fast or no. everything going okay so far? So these are the three things, and these are the things that I'm most, I would say passionate about, making sure people hit home when it comes to nutrition. These are kind of my three principles that I make sure everyone kind of has a good understanding with. So these food choices are centered around whole foods. They prioritize eating the right amounts for you, what your goals are, whether it's weight loss, whether it's putting on muscle, whether it is maintaining your weight, maybe you're at a weight that you feel the best at, you want to stay here, and it's making sure that it's finding that right amount for you. And probably the most important one might be that last piece where it's that consistent factor. One salad, one workout isn't going to be that much of a change, but over time, compounds on each other, just like when you're investing in stocks or anything like that, years and years and years add up, more workouts, more healthy choices, smarter choices, are going to make sure that you have that kind of compounding effect that continues to build and improve that health over time. So we're going to kind of go through and break these down one by one. There we go. Cool. So we're going to break through these, break these down kind of one by one, so you have a real clear understanding of not just how important these are, but also kind of how to start implementing these types of things. So we're talking about whole foods. Right? We want to make sure that we're realizing that whole foods are going to really prioritize that nutrient <coughs> density. So per serving size, how much benefit are you getting from that food that you are consuming and putting on your plate? It doesn't sound like it's stuff that's new. It's not really cutting edge science. 
but it hits home, and I think some of this stuff might help realize how important that simple, easier said than done, simple switch could, switch could really be. So we're looking about the amount of foods that should be whole. We're kind of looking at that 80 to 90%, 10 to 20%. Um, that 80-20 or the Pareto's principle, I think it is, where it's that kind of gives you, as long as you're doing like 80% of this, it'll allow you with some flexibility where you can have some more things and have options when life gives you some things that you just have to adjust and work around. On the flip side are processed foods that we're being always told to stay away from or more calorie dense. So this is where you're not going to get a whole lot of nutritional value. It's going to be way more just energy, stuff that's going to give you maybe a quick burst for 20, 30, maybe an hour, but then you're going to feel like you need something else shortly afterwards. Some of the three most important key features from these whole foods is they're going to be less likely for you to overeat, and that comes from a variety of factors. Not just the fact that the complete nutrition profile is going to have uh, more things like fiber, might have more digestible sources of protein, but it's also going to be related to the speed at which you eat these foods. They're going to be needing more chews. They're going to be needing more time to break down and actually move through the system, which relates to helping you feel full over a longer period of time, which might make you eat a little bit less. Also, it takes a lot of effort. It's pretty easy to eat a candy bar, but to cut up like a freshly cooked steak, you know, you got to work a little bit to get that single bite. So we talked about the complete nutrition profile a little bit more, and we also have things that are also more beneficial to health in them, kind of more for fighting um, inflammation, oxidative stress, things like these antioxidants and polyphenols, which are plant chemicals, plant compounds that have a good ability to um, fight off some of these um, diseases that might come run rampant sometimes. Our processed foods tend to be higher in fat, sugar, and salt. That's kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the three horsemen, if you will, of tasty and processed foods. The best example I can give of this, I think one of my teachers from years ago told me this, but if you take bacon, dip it in sugar and sprinkle it in salt, that's gonna be like one of the most tasty foods you could ever have, just the way those flavors hit. But with that, they're easy to overeat. Um, again, I like examples, it makes things real. Potato chips, like those kinds of things never really stick to the serving size. If you do, God bless you, but they're easy to snack on, um, especially in the middle of like football season when you're just sitting on the couch, family might be over, friends are over, very mindless thing to do. So in combination of these things, they're also tough to manage some of those intolerances, <coughs> some of those sensitivities. If anyone does have any type of um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, gluten sensitivity or celiac disease where gluten can cause some type of disruption to your gut, it might be hard to manage what foods are triggering, what foods are not, if you are having these types of processed foods as the majority of your diet, because it's tough to wean out which one's which, which one's containing the, the problematic source versus something where it's a little bit of a, you know, more that hopeful source that's more closer or it's closer to its natural state. So this little blurb here, um, I like to point out, um, and I'm going to read this as is for the most part, but I think this paints a pretty good picture of how important this switch is. Um, this is from a, a study from a few years ago uh, where they took a group of people who ate a processed food diet, eat as much calories as you want, not really tracking anything, and then they had a group to a whole food based diet where they matched the exact serving of what they gave them. So the calories and the macronutrients all matched up together, so it was as equal as it can be, with the exception of one being whole food, one being processed foods. And then after, I think it was two weeks, they then switched. So, does everybody get that, like, for the most part? So, this is a good summary of what this kind of came to, was uh, subjects were instructed to consume as much or as little as desired. Energy intake, so calories consumed, were greater during the ultra processed diet by almost, this says, at the most about 500 calories extra just from the processed food diet with increased consumption of carbohydrates and fats, but protein which stayed the same. And weight changes, so the changes in body weight were highly correlated with that energy intake with participants gaining an average of uh, kilograms, so about two to three kilograms or 
in the math. About two to three, one, two to three pounds more during the ultra processed diet and losing about two to three pounds after switching to the unprocessed diet. So just by making that simple switch can reduce calories that you're taking and it can also help to move in more into that um, weight loss kind of calorie deficit, which is that main driver. Does that make sense? So that last sentence there, limiting consumption of ultra processed foods may be an effective strategy for obesity treatment and prevention. This kind of shows like the power of just that, of what that switch can do for you. So more and more, I, I, I like when this happens, because um, the more and more I come to this slide, more people have confusion and questions. So we're talking about how to find whole foods. These are, there's some gray area in between here, because there's a lot of things on the shelf. There's a lot of things that you're not entirely sure is this processed, is not processed. So <clears throat> these are some things that might help steer you in a direction to find a better conclusion to that question of, is this a processed food or is this a whole food? So basically, does it come from the ground or an animal? Right? We're talking about, let's say, steak comes right from the cow, milk comes from a cow, um, beans and corn, um, oats, rice, kind of come, and veggies all come from that, that, that natural ground source. I like this one a lot. Could your parents or grandparents eat this food when they were growing up? There's a lot of foods now. Some, I see some, some head shaking over there. Yes. So there's a lot of foods now that might not have been around 20, 30, 40 years ago, however far back you feel like you need to go. Um, but the basics of whole food is like kind of how close it was eaten to its natural state and natural form. So, and that's that second, or that third one there is, is it eaten in its simplest form or does it go through a series of steps that change it to the point where you can actually eat it and consume it in that final state. Example here can be something like potatoes. There's a lot of different ways to use and cook potatoes. We have the regular potato or sweet potato, like a baked one, or you have your chips and french fries. Um, and that sort of thing. Still comes from the same source, but there's just a way more steps that go on for that. And then some of the characteristics of these processed foods, kind of we touched on a little bit. They do taste really good, let's not lie. A lot of them do have some pretty good flavors to them. <laughs> but they are easy to eat, easy to mindlessly eat, easy to eat fast, tend to be higher in calories with little nutrients. And even though it's not the, always the best indicator, a longer list of ingredients might be paired up with a, a more processed type food. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, with that, uh, like for example, like when I was a child, I never know what potato chips were mm -hmm. or anything. Yeah. Like everything was either uh, fruits or vegetables uh -huh. that come from uh, the land. Okay. Uh, directly from the garden to, yeah. mm -hmm. to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. You know, never overeat yeah. in that situation. But mm -hmm. now kids that grow up in the city, mm -hmm. uh, they can end up eating three bags of potato chips. Yes, exactly. No yes, uh, is the presentation, the mm -hmm. taste, the yeah. flavor. Again, obesity in this country and children is it's it is scary it's sometimes. Scary. A lot of times, um, and it's the people who make the food. Sometimes I think of them as like evil geniuses. <laughs> Because they really know how to manipulate it mm -hmm. to yeah. fit the texture, the taste, mm -hmm. the the. Well, what food chemists do is they take the foods apart, mm -hmm. and then they process the ingredients. Like I was told once, uh, uh, all organic, all every material in a, in a plant or an animal can be divided into three major categories: mm -hmm. protein, carbohydrate, lipid. Mm -hmm. For example, vitamin C is a carbohydrate. For example. The molecule is very similar to glucose. Mm -hmm. the, the the structure yeah, the, of right. it. So what they do, for example, they take the soybean and they isolate it out. They rip it apart, basically. Yeah. Chemically. They isolate the protein mm -hmm. that's sold as isolated soy protein, mm -hmm. and it's used in high protein drinks or yeah. kind of stuff. They take the carbohydrate, and that's uh, that's sold as a maltodextrin and mm -hmm. stuff Dextrose like that. Dextrose or something like that. Then they take the fat that's sold as lecithin. Mm -hmm. It's all natural. They claim it's natural, mm -hmm. but it's all been denatured. Yeah. They basically ruined, you know, the the biology that the yeah. nature made it. Yeah. And they make a lot of products out of those constituents. Mm -hmm. And like you say, the evil geniuses, the <laughs> evil food chemists, mm -hmm. they take these things, they split them, they mm -hmm. they modify them, they flavor them, they do yeah. all sorts of things to it. And in my opinion, it's yep. not it's not real food anymore. 
Mm. Yeah, there's there's a case for that, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, there's no standard definition for the term whole food. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the FDA doesn't control it at all. There's a lot of weirdo products, uh, especially in the health food industry. Yeah. They say whole food vitamins, baloney. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's not controlled, so you got to really be careful. Yeah. So I always like the expression, I always said to people, my opinion is, eat what your grandparents ate. Yeah. yeah well, if it looks like a potato, eat it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Going back Whatever. to that, my grandparents died in 94, never took any medication. They were always yeah. lean, meaning never had problems of obesity or anything. That was their lifestyle. And I was like that when I was, until I was an adult and moved to the city. Uh -huh. Then I started gaining weight and, and you know, I grew all the, those yeah. health issues. My grandparents never was never had diabetes, high blood pressure, medication. Mm -hmm. They died <laughs> at 93 without touching any medication. Mm -hmm. They also worked out, right? Exercise. Yes, they and, oh, yeah. like, not thinking about car. it. You didn't have a yeah. car, so yeah. you walked yeah. my, uh, yeah. burned my all the calories. My, my grand grandpa on my mom's side died two years ago now and he was ninety five. Yeah. But he was walking his entire life. He was doing everything up until he couldn't anymore, basically, and same thing with my grandma after she got, um, she had to get her knee replaced, but that kind of set her up in a little bit, but the walking, yeah. the the food that, like you said, the food that they had, it was all oh, in its true. natural form, yeah. and the natural form, going back to ways that helps to kind of keep you feeling full, it works differently with your body than it does when it's isolated, like Bob was saying. Absolutely. Also, growing uh, and farming. We had no chemicals whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Everything was all natural. Mm -hmm. uh, not no pesticides, no mm -hmm. no fertilizers, no nothing. The 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 was all natural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's it is something that does have that big impact, and it goes sometimes beyond just the food because then, as you start peeling back the layers, it's like, how do we keep the food available for the mass population? How do we make it available and stay long enough on the farms for everything? So it's definitely a bigger picture than just don't use it. So it's it's going to be a long-term public health kind of process to, to make everything that you were saying kind of back into the system again. Um, so Where does chocolate yeah. fit into this? What's that? <laughs> chocolate, is that processed food? <laughs> that goes into the, uh, the 10 to 20%. Okay. <laughs> the flexibility. All right, so we're talking about eating the right amount now. Um, a lot of stuff out there, I don't know if anyone's on like Instagram or Facebook often, but that's where you kind of get the most clash between different ways of eating, methods of diet, or not dieting, but lifestyle, eating, that kind of stuff. Um, and when it comes to weight management, it still comes down to calories in, calories, calories, in, calories out. All those diets that we mentioned before, all the ones that you see popping up and trending, they all manipulate calories in, calories out in some way, <coughs> shape, or form. Mm -hmm. If you opt for a keto, low-carb way, you're just reducing a lot of the carbs that you're having, especially if those carbs are coming from highly processed foods, like you know donuts, sweets, cakes, and pizza, that kind of stuff. Taking those out, most likely you're gonna reduce your calories by a lot. Plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, you're taking away a lot of the calories you might be consuming from meat and dairy products. Not that those are bad, but it's just a way to manipulate it in a way that fits your lifestyle and preferences. And things like fiber, like you might get more fiber with a plant-based, which helps, but also something like a keto protein that you're getting or more, more animal-based protein is also gonna help keep you feeling full. So as you can see, there's a lot more commonalities when you kind of peel back these different layers. But ultimately, when it comes to finding the right amount, we wanna make sure that there's ways that we can do it that you can kind of be self-sufficient with rather than relying on a food scale every time you eat, rather than relying on measuring every single thing. So it's good to be in the ballpark, but it's also <clears throat> important to remember that there's these kind of strategies that can be helpful to mitigate your chances of going over those calories that you should uh, uh, be recommended to stick to. So we have our mindful eating, which is like hunger cues, right? Do I eat when I'm hungry or do I eat when I'm bored? Do I eat when I'm sitting at the, on the couch watching TV after work, or can I uh, maybe distract myself with some other task or something else that gets my mind away from hunger? Because hunger is just a feeling, it's a sensation. It's not something that always has to be acted upon. Um, but if I can find ways and strategies to maybe delay that hunger by the foods I am eating, or if I can maybe 
notice a pattern and try to break that pattern can be a good way to help control some of those cravings that you might get at night. And just being more aware of kind of the stuff that we are putting on our plate and eventually into our bodies. Then we have our hand portions. So has anyone heard of the hand portions before a little bit? Where your palm is about the size of your protein, fist is about a serving of veggies, the length of your thumb, thumb is about a, a serving of fat, so like nuts, butter, that kind of stuff. And then your cupped kind of palm is like a, a I think it's like a half cup of carbohydrates. So there's an image coming up that'll explain that a little bit more clearly so you can see it. But I like that one because you can get a gauge. If you look at your plate, you're like, oh, I have three palmful sizes of steak. Do I really need three? I can maybe work on getting two. And it's cool because it's with you all the time. And a lot of times it's relative a little bit more to your body proportions. Someone who's bigger, taller than I am, probably gonna have a bigger hand relative to mine. So, and then the other strategy is that calorie counting, right? Which is if you want more precision. Um, this is what probably someone who would be looking more for um, specific body composition related changes, like people who are competing in bodybuilding, people who are competing or training for, let's say, a uh, um, a combat sport, they have to make weight for their competition, wrestling, grappling, MMA kind of stuff. Uh, even uh, weightlifting, right? they have to be mindful because they have their own weight classes. Right. Um, is the other kind of option that we can use as well. So this table here can come in handy. Um, there's a couple of different columns here relative to the goal and how active you are. Because we have that scale, calories in versus calories out. Calories in is food that you're eating. Calories out is your energy expenditure. Someone who's more active is going to need more calories just to support that activity, support the recovery and the performance, compared to someone who might have a less of an active kind of schedule. So what you can do here, and again, I'm going to send this to everybody so they have it, is kind of decide how active you are. And there's different kind of categories with lightly, lightly active being less than three hours a week of some kind of activity, moderately active, three to seven hours, and then very active is more than seven hours. And then depending on what your goal is, you can multiply your body weight by any one of these columns there. So for example, um, if I'm 170 pounds and I decide that I'm moderately active and I want to lose weight, I can multiply that by 12 and by 14 to kind of get a, a calorie range for myself. A simpler method you can do is specific more to losing weight is take your goal body weight, multiply that by 12. So that's a good starting point. And again, when it comes to these things are starting points versus clear cut science. If you look at some of the calorie calculators that you might find online, you can do three different ones and you're going to get hit with some different numbers. They're all estimations, but at least it gives you something to target and something you can kind of test and see, is this working or do I have to adjust it a little bit more? So uh, go over that again, targeted weight times 12 gives you how many calories you want to Yeah, consider. so I said I'm 175, if I want to do go down to 170, oh, I would say 170 times 12. Okay. That's where I want to start my calories at, and then from there, we can work backwards. Um, but I'll talk about some of the more, um, kind of what we were talking about in the beginning, the major versus the minors in a little bit. I also have another question. Is yeah, it better to please. count calories or the fat grams? So for me, I focus more on the calories because it's a simpler approach. Okay. And then rather than fat, protein and fiber are going to be the two that are going to be most important, in my opinion at least. Okay. So as you can see, there's some different numbers on some of the protein targets. Uh, for protein, 0 0.8 to 1.35 grams per pound. So for most people, about 0 0.8 to 1 is going to be the, the kind of range there. Higher than that is going to be, again, those more active people, those bodybuilders who have a lot of muscle. We're trying to maybe put on muscle for a show um, or someone who's just very, very active in the gym or some kind of athletic event. And then when I say grams per pound, take that, whatever that number is, and multiply it by your, your weight. So for example, again, using that 170, I would take the 170 times 0 0.8, or I could use 1 which is kind of right in the middle there. And then same thing there. So we have 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 grams per pound for our fat intake. And then carbohydrates, again, big range, but people who are marathon runners, 
you're going to take a lot more food, a lot more of those carbohydrates than someone who maybe runs a couple miles a week just to stay in shape. So big individualization here. And the two most important things that kind of get manipulated are these fats and carbohydrates. Calories and proteins are going to stay the same, stay um, consistent throughout any type of kind of um, weight loss gain management type program or phase. So here's just a real life example of what some of the, these numbers could look like. For a very active female, right, her goal is to maintain weight and, and just you're good. Um, keep her performance high. So her calories were inputted as 2,295, which is at 135 times that 17 from the table. So I'll just go back so you can see it. 135 times that 17, right about there. So that's kind of where she would fall. And then protein, carbohydrates, and fats. And then a moderately active female, uh, male whose goal is to lose weight. He did 2,405 times 13 from the table. Set his protein 148 to 185, kind of in that 0.8 to 1 gram range. And then carbohydrates and fats. So just what some of these numbers might look like for different people based on different goals. So his goal, the moderately active male yeah. who wants to lose weight, has to now eat less than 2,400 calories. No, those are the calories that he should be eating. So, okay. Yes. So that's yep. not, so he's going based on what he was like earlier, to, like maybe your target weight is what you want to calculate your calories at. Yeah, so 185 times 13 to lose weight, moderate active, would kind he's of be- He's gonna multiply it by, right. Right, yeah, 13. I, I just okay. used right in the middle there. Okay, that's just, just trying to, but yeah. just trying to lose weight. Okay, yeah. versus she was trying to make team weight. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. So that's that. Uh, any more questions on that? Okay. Clarification? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Jen, mm -hmm. right, so I mentioned protein and fiber, right? These are gonna be the two kind of most important nutrients to really make sure you're getting. Um, these are going to be protein uh, supporting building muscle, supporting connective tissue like ligaments, skin, healthy hair, nails, um, but also certain things that take place in the body that help speed up reactions and speed up just the biological processes that take place. Um, and the most important thing is they keep us feeling full. The protein that we are going to have does have a very um, filling effect to it, and it does create us with that satisfaction and that satiation of I've had enough to eat, I feel full, I feel content, I don't need any more. And protein, that range is gonna be what we talked about before, kind of 0 0.8 to one. Fiber, not only great for gut health, kind of associated with a lot of positive benefits with the more you have, the more the intake is, the more re risk reduction is for a lot of diseases of mortality, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, and uh, helps you to create just that good balance to get a lot of those other plant chemicals that are helpful for us, like antioxidants, polyphenols, that kind of stuff. And again, help us feeling full. So when we're talking about things to look at, we want to focus on the calories and we want to focus on ways we can select foods and <coughs> prioritize these two things here. And for fiber, for females, a good recommendation is 25 grams per day, and then males, it's about 35 grams per day. Is that a question? I'm not a scientist, let's see, but here's where I would something I would wonder about. Please. Uh, again, the difference between uh, natural protein, like the, the steak that's not yeah. processed, mm -hmm. or the uh, vegetable Please. stuff in protein, yeah. versus a denatured protein that's been split apart from. Like a protein shake or something? Well, let's or say isolated soy protein. Yeah. My question would be, can the, let's say, for example, could isolated soy protein actually help make hormones, enzymes, and transport proteins equal Mm -hmm. to an undenatured protein? So I, I would kind of doubt it. So some of it... In other words, whole food versus yeah. processed, yep. isolated, chemically yeah. altered food. I don't know specifically about the enzymes and the hormones. Right. A lot of the stuff that I've looked at when it comes to like, was more like just like muscle building. Yeah. But the comparison between those types of things like the isolated protein and protein shakes Different varieties, different types, as well as compared to like regular food, right. like in that natural form, does have the ability to help grow muscle and build muscle tissue. I'd imagine that based off of that information, 
it would have an effect and would help to create some of those things that you mentioned, the hormones, the enzymes, because what we use in the protein, it's really like the amino acids that build the protein. So proteins are the building blocks of kind of our muscles, but then these amino acids are they're they're they're, they're smaller. If you're if you ever heard those terms before. Well, amino acids, yes. Right? Yeah. So there's like 18. Uh, uh, yeah. There's so there's 22, 22 total. Some of which I think are 18 are essential, I believe. Yeah. There's some of them are essential, essential yeah. and then some are non-essential that we can make on our own. Right. But well, the body is an amazing family. Oh, it's incredible. But in, I think in a way you're forcing the body to reprocess this mm -hmm. isolated stuff to put it in a form that it yes. can use. But I think uh, because what you really get is the amino acids that's part of the, the protein isolate right. that would then in turn help create the other stuff. That's my theory. Uh, I'll say for muscle building, it tends to build the muscle. Um, but for the more specific stuff, I don't know exactly, but that, yeah, would, that would be my theory on it. Um, good question though. Um, so fiber is that. So here's a little bit more of that hand portion method if you've never seen it before. Um, easy to use in any situation. Easy just to build some kind of reference, some kind of awareness. And that's the biggest thing when it comes to portioning control. Is just becoming aware of what you're eating, how it's making you feel. Not just from a fullness standpoint, but is it making you feel bloated, gassy, uncomfortable, lightheaded maybe, anything like that. That doesn't give you like the the satisfaction that you really should be getting from some of these foods. As opposed to calorie counting, which in my opinion sometimes can be really annoying. Um, trying to do every single calorie, every single macronutrient, we're measuring food. When I get home, we got to take care of the animals that we have, so I don't really want to measure everything out. Um, and then eating until satisfied, not stuff. This is a big one that, again, kind of ties back into that hunger cues, the awareness. Rather than just going and going until I feel like I'm, I'm full and I can't take any more, slowing down, chewing a little bit more, maybe putting the fork, fork down, maybe even having some conversations a little bit more with the people that you're having food with can help kind of realize that, okay, I have just enough right now. I'm at that threshold where I'm satisfied, I feel content, I don't need to get that second plate. A uh, strategy I like for people is if you think you need the second plate, just wait like three minutes to see if you really need it or is it just that, that routine, that habit that we're just trying to break. But as you can see, it's more about kind of these pattern changes and behavior change that really keep nutrition sustainable and consistent. Um, but these are some of my favorite methods of portion controlling that don't necessarily rely on doing math. Okay, cool. Got it? <laughs> Got it. Cool. Okay. All right, so we're talking about planning. Planning is kind of bringing everything we talked about into action, right? So, um, Planning out your meals can be a huge help. It takes maybe five to 10 minutes if you wanna really sit down and do every single meal. But by planning out in advance, you're kind of getting ahead of the game. You're reducing the uh, impulse to just wing it when it comes up. And that's one of the biggest things that I've realized as my schedule like, has gotten busier and busier and busier. The more I can kind of plan tomorrow's stuff out tonight or today, can be a big change and a big help because then you don't have to worry about it, you don't have to think about it. There's a, the, the phrase decision fatigue that comes up a lot and it's, it's a pretty, pretty massive impact on your day-to-day -day choices. Um, you don't want to sit there always contemplating, what do I have to do next, what should I do, what should I do? You kind of just want to have it set and go. So by taking five minutes the night before, plan out what you want for lunch or take a look at the menu that you're going out to eat later that night might be a good strategy just to just to know what's coming your way and to be prepared versus just kind of going on the fly where you might revert back to some of the, the old ways which might not be aligned with what you're trying to accomplish for your health moving forward. Uh, not just meals, but plan out when you can shop, right? Schedules are tough. If it's on the schedule, it might not get done. Uh, so making sure you actually kind of plan out where that stuff can go. And plan out block out time to cook if you do want to cook in bulk. Um, another thing you can do is cook extra. You're making two chickens for dinner, maybe make three, and now you have one for the next day lunch or leftovers for tomorrow. And you're not doing any extra time with that. You're just adding an extra chicken to the meal you're currently making. And this quote kind of stands out a little bit. Failing to plan is planning to fail. So having some idea of what you can do next can be a great way just to keep you moving forward and again, just have that uh, confidence that you know what to do next. 
So we're talking about preparing the foods. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Right, some of this stuff I just kind of brought up there. Cooking in bulk can be a good way to set up for the week. Uh, make a big salad that's easy to pick and go. Uh, make, we make at our, at our house, uh, we make a ground beef once a week just to have it ready for those emergency meals. We have a, um, we always have some kind of protein source in our fridge, whether it's some type of rotisserie chicken, some type of meat, cooked chicken or um, the turkey or the ground beef, something that's easy to access, ready to go that we can go on a fly. And then veggies. Do I have veggies in the frozen veggies ready to go, or like like that I can just take out and cook if I need them? Do I have ones that are cooked that I just can put in a bowl and take for lunch? So those are things that are going to get make it easier for you to make those day to day decisions that are going to impact how much you can stick to those three principles before of like whole foods, right amounts, and consistency. And then I have a question. Yeah. Where does something like turkey lunch meat? Um, I'm probably I, healthier than like Sahani, yeah. Right? <laughs> but again, like the, like I said, this is a, a part of it that always comes up. It's like where do these things fit on the scale? I always think there's always kind of three things to keep in mind. There's probably with the, uh, the, the with the decision that you've just made to, to have something to eat. There's kind of three decisions: uh, the smart decision, not the smart, it's a bad word, but the decision you did make, a better decision and a possibly a, worth, uh, a worse decision that you avoided. So a good example with the turkey, a better decision if you had time, because context still matters here, especially in the real world, maybe turkey breasts that you cooked yourself. Okay. It's a better option, the turkey slice, than the salami, than something that might be a little more processed, that kind of stuff. Uh, the same conversation I had with someone, actually a client of mine today, um, sometimes some of those granola bars can be a little a little hit or miss on that process scale, that process continuum. But a granola bar, it might be worse than maybe some uh, all natural like trail mix with maybe just nuts and some dried fruit, but it's better than the Snickers bar. <laughs> so there's some context in there and there's mm -hmm. context to help people, just like with training and fitness, we like mm -hmm. incrementally make exercise harder. But taking the approach the same way can make it easier for you to start making those baby steps to move less processed to more whole food based. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Um, that and then, so options. So, LIFO is always going to throw us off track some way, shape, or form. Um, but being able to have some options as backups can be a great way to just keep that train moving in the right direction. So, some common scenarios that come up you're at a restaurant on the whim, look at the menu beforehand, you're working late at night from home, maybe you have to order out, but backtracking and knowing what foods to get, picking a protein, picking a vegetable, picking one that is going to be more whole food based can help you make decisions and from almost any restaurant. A lot of restaurants these days have a lot of those kind of smart calorie options that they put on their menu list. Um, those are good things to choose from but also you can intentionally not have all of something you have and save it for lunch the next day. So those leftovers are going to be a big way too that you can just kind of control those portions, but also set yourself up for lunch the next day. Um, so, and then again, kind of what we just talked about, that kind of minim minimally processed, the uh, ultra processed food scale. Ultra processed to me is things like the donuts, the pizza, the french fries, the chicken tenders, stuff that we've already been knowing as like is not good for us. Minimally processed might be something um, that is more closer to its form, maybe something like, a, like beef jerky. Right, yeah, there's some processing involved, but it's still closer to its original source than like a protein shake. So there are some things, and again, it's context dependent, preference dependent, um, but at least it's a better option than maybe the high sugar, the high, the high, high fat choices that are also out there. Something interesting I saw one time, and that makes me think about the restaurants. Um, I used to go to a restaurant here in Manto uh, to eat shrimp scampi. Mm -hmm. And then one day I saw they were taking the garbage out and the boxes, mm -hmm. shrimp scampi, shrimp scampi they had. So oh, it's oh. pre-made, pre uh -huh. they just heat it up. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Yeah. Now you can imagine if a restaurant has to feed a hundred people. I, I'm a cook, so mm -hmm. I know. I said, okay, so most of the food, do they have freezers yeah. and they keep as, Pre-made. Plus, uh -huh. you order right. the food and they bring to your table. And 
15, 20 right. minutes. There are some things that I cook that may take me an hour. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. <laughs> most of the restaurants actually they have the frozen food, they reheat it, they, yeah. they, they yeah. add something. And, and mm -hmm. Mm, that's interesting. Right. Yeah, interesting. and I like on that point too. And I should have said this before. Actually, I almost showed the slide, so it works. Um, when you are trying to figure out places for lunch on of work, if you're on the road, best advice I always give people is go to places where you can, can better control what they're putting on, what they're giving you. So Chipotle is a good example because you can pick and choose. Mm -hmm. I like rice, beans, steak, fajita vegetables. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit of guacamole if I'm feeling a little fun that day. <laughs> But you can have the idea and tell them, this is what I want, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Even something as Wawa could be a good choice just because you can control how, what you're putting on. What's the name of that restaurant? There was a restaurant on the Route 23, so you can see them cook in the back. Okay. Same thing, they will bring a pre-made yeah. frozen food, just reheat it and add like maybe parsley or something to look like it's freshly made. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Frozen food, not the worst thing. Yeah, sometimes a lot of the frozen vegetables, it can maintain the shelf life and keep and preserve it. But, but again, the over add time, a lot of flavors and sauces, then it's a little different. The yeah. Um, so we're gonna kind of go over some of the six steps here to create a perfect meal. Start with protein, fish, to uh, steak, to tempeh if you're like a, in that vegetarian, plant-based realm. Pick a veggie too, green beans or carrots. Pick a smart kind of carbohydrate, so this would be something like potato, uh, rice, um, couscous, something like that. I love couscous, it's one of my favorites. Um, so good they named it twice. <laughs> <Couscous. laughs> um, pick a healthy fat, olive oil, a little bit of butter can, can be here as well. Um, and then add some of those flavors just to make it pop and sizzle. If you're a cook, this is where you can add your, your special sauce or special flair you have. And then last step is kind of cook and enjoy. So ultimately, think about what healthy means to you, what your relationship with nutrition, what your relationship with food is. Is it something that you want to be hyper-focused on? Is it something where you want to have that 80 to 90% be these things that are going to be beneficial for you? Or is it going to be um, something that might be a little more like 85-15? You have the ability to move it, but again, it's as long as the bulk of your diet and your nutrition is centered around those whole foods, eating the right amounts, and picking the pattern of eating that you can stay consistent with, chances are pretty high you're going to be doing a lot of good things right. Protein and fiber are going to be the kind of most important things to look at. Protein is going to keep us feeling full. Fiber is going to keep us feeling full, and they're both going to help just our overall body function effectively and efficiently. Planning, preparing, and having those options is going to make it easier for you to stay consistent. And again, we didn't touch on a whole lot of today, but physical activity goes hand in hand. Staying active, getting your steps, um, getting some type of maybe resistance training, strength training in, so that you can continue to build muscle, continue to stay mobile and flexible, and just keep your joints lubricated and moving well. And then the good nutrition approach is that one that fits into your lifestyle. It shouldn't make you upend and reroute everything. It should fit into your routine. It should fit with the things that you want to accomplish. And it shouldn't, in my opinion, it shouldn't make you feel overwhelmed. It should be something that eventually becomes autopilot and second nature. And then it's just on routine. It's just a cycle of just, this is what I do. This is how I live. I have the nutrition. I know I'm doing the right way. And I know I have some flexibility in there to enjoy the little things that food has to offer as well. So if you do want more from me, um, just where you guys can find me here, um, I have some cars and flyers out as well. Um, but like I said, personal training in Fairfield, um, and then I do remote personal training, and then nutrition coaching is mostly remote as well. And then if I email, you can always ask questions at any point, and then um, Instagram and website's there as well. Um, and with that, that is it.